so so welcome everyone and and thank you very much to to, to peter and to the strategy unit for for inviting me to participate um in this it's a real privilege to be part of something so interesting and creative and and different and optimistic especially in such a, a dark and difficult time so i have the task of setting the scene a little bit uh for our discussion and, and peter i absolutely support your words we have a, a fantastic um panel um to discuss these things with. So by setting the scene, I want to just start by thinking and reflecting a little bit with you on the profound changes that have happened over the last six or so months. Um, in, in the field in which I work, we call this a health system shock. Everything about the way that we work in the health system has been turned upside down. And I know this from the work that I'm involved with directly, and I see a couple of my um, team members here, so, so that's really wonderful. Thank you for, for joining. Um, but uh, we know that some of the changes in the health system that we've been trying to um, bring about for years and sometimes decades, some things have just happened all of a sudden. I mean, it's quite extraordinary um, how quickly change can happen for good and for not good. And I guess that's partly what we'll talk about. So there's been a really abrupt change in the way that we structure the health system, in the way that we deliver health care. We now we've moved from face to face to virtual interactions very quickly and then are trying to move back. And then, you know, we're seesawing a little bit, to be honest. Some of these things are very beneficial in, in that they're protecting the vulnerable uh, and, and also uh, coping with staff shortages. Um, and redeploying people very, very quickly. And, and, and some of us have had to resurrect skills long dormant um, to, to work in the front line and, and so on and so forth. But it's meant, it has meant delaying and stopping other things. And so there's potential harm there too. So um, this astonishing rate of change has been particularly interesting and worrying for children. And, um, and that's what we're here to talk about. So some people call this a reverse Titanic effect. And I think that spells out really what our concerns are, because you'll remember, of course, that great phrase, which I'm told actually didn't come from the Titanic, but from a different um, ship. But nonetheless, the point is the idea of women and children first has been exactly the opposite in this case. Women and children last. And so at the very beginning of these episodes, we started to worry about things like what was going to happen with safeguarding, all of that quiet hidden harm behind closed doors when people are trapped at home. What's going to happen with vaccination rates, the routine universal services on which so much of health depends? What happens when you're not doing face-to-face -face care? What happens to the quality of healthcare? What happens to the personal relations that are important for delivering effective care? What on earth is going to happen with mental health? And, and although you know, we started thinking about this six months ago, boy, if we started to see that um, become a worry uh, in, in, you know, immediately. What's going to happen with school? And again, that's been very much in the headlines. And of course, essentially, um, what is happening with children's social development? Play, of course, is children's work. Children's essential uh, occupation is to play because that helps them develop and learn. And what happens when you cannot socialize and play in the way that you could and should be able to do for your normal that development? What is happening to these children? So what we've started to see over the last few months is some alarming things. We've started to see, for example, an increase in the stillbirth rate. We have seen a small but nonetheless worrying rise in suicide rate. Now, when I say small but nonetheless worrying, I think anything uh, above zero is, 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 is regrettable and, and should, be, um, should be avoidable. Um, but there has, in fact, been a rise in suicide among children and young people, unfortunately. Health visitors are reporting growing concerns about vulnerable children behind those closed doors. Very hard to measure what is happening, but the, the, there's a, there are really worrying reports about what might be going on or what's being missed. Indirect effects that are hugely worrying are, is, is a pretty dramatic rise in hunger. Um, so a fifth of households are reportedly unable to access sufficient food. That, this was during lockdown, and I think it's getting worse rather than better, even though there isn't lockdown, because, of course, don't forget, we have austerity as a background to all of this and, and uh, the rising unemployment rate that's been going on during lockdown and, and the knock-on effects of that. 
And also, unfortunately, in the, in the first six months of this year, the, the number of children who were admitted to hospital in this country, which still remains a rich country, the number of children who've been admitted to hospital with malnutrition has doubled compared with last year. Now, I don't know about you, I'm a, I'm a pediatrician by background, but ad children admitted with malnutrition should really is a, a huge signal of alarm. Um, and indeed, um, children with and young people with pre-existing mental health issues, 60% um, of them report worsening in their problems. And then for amongst young people without pre-existing mental health problems, around 40% of them are reporting uh, significantly increased stress and other problems. So, which brings me on to the um, other interesting way of looking at what the problems are. I hope you all have seen the marvellous report that Peter and his colleagues in the strategy unit have put out about the impact on health services that's going on with children. Now, it's important to look at this because it tells us something about what is not happening. So there have been dramatic reductions in hospital service use. Now some of that's good probably but we don't actually know um, what is happening that is not good. So for example we know that there have been dramatic reductions across the board in almost every problem and almost every cause and almost every level of, of urgency there has been drops. So people are just not coming in. Sometimes that, as I say, that might be signaling whether um, there's scope for doing things in better ways, but there's also a lot of hidden harm that we're worried about. So I think there's an enormous amount of stuff that we need to be considering both on the, on the, uh, uh, on the, on the side of, of harm, both direct and indirect, and also what new opportunities can we learn from what's going on um, from the health system shock that has happened and the impact on children. So let's turn ourselves now to thinking about the issues at hand, the trauma that's affected children directly and indirectly as a result of COVID. And let's start the conversation. Um, I thought I would, um, I'm going to try and help steer that conversation um, amongst our panellists. Um, and I thought I would start by asking Swaran, who is an expert in children and young people's mental health, to, to, to help us start the discussion by asking him the question whether, whether he thinks we understand yet the extent of the COVID-related trauma on children and young people. So I'll over to you. Thank you, Ingrid. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'd like to draw an analogy, which is that when we conduct science, we put a lot of effort in taking away confounders and to take away the effect of the observer. So you conduct a trial, you randomize people, you make assessment blind. The idea is that the observer is dispassionate and outside of the experiment. In this situation, it's we are living in a test tube. We are the observers and the subjects as well. It is very difficult right now to say what the effect will be. We can speculate, and I think we can already see, like you said, there are robust indications that there are going to be significant damaging and negative mental health effects of the pandemic. But it may take us years and years to truly understand what, what, the, what the impact is. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't, um, we don't start preparing or we, we, we are not proactive. I, I just want to draw, draw to your attention that uh, in 10 years time, everyone will turn out to be, have been correct. You know, all our, everybody will say, I told you so, uh, because it will be such a complex picture. Uh, Mao, Mao Zedong was asked in an interview, uh, what do you think is the impact of the French revolution on European development? And he said, it's too early to tell. <laughs> so it, 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 it's too early to tell, I'm, 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 uh, but we know that uh, there is going to be significant negative uh, impact on children and we've got to do what we can to mitigate that and to protect them from it. Yes, yes indeed. Um, 
Well, maybe that um, leads nicely into um, asking Nigel for his views about, well, we'd be, I'm sure we'd all really love to hear about your experiences um, in other uh, trauma settings and trauma examples. And perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that, Nigel, and then, and then comment on how, how you see this particular traumatic episode and, and what, how can we use what you've learned and done in other traumatic episodes to help us in, in this one? Very interesting. Yes, well, first of all, good afternoon. Wonderful to be invited. Wonderful company. Very privileged to be here. Um, yes, I'm a humble musician and aid worker, um, and I don't have a great deal of knowledge about what is happening now on the ground, though I have been working as a volunteer for the NHS, developing resources for trauma-informed care, and I am beginning to advise certain education authorities on how we might go forwards. Um, uh, my work has been um, with children in zones of conflict, it's work that began almost by accident. I was working on human rights at the time when in the war in Bosnia, um, things were getting worse and worse for children. And as uh, we were becoming more and more impotent to change things politically, I could see on the ground that there were things we could do practically for children, and we did. And so we developed programs with music for children that were successful beyond our expectations. We thought we were just distracting the children and then the Ministry of Health came along and said, no, this is that we really like this intervention, this therapeutic intervention. So we have permission to use that word. Uh, and, and we developed it as they, as, as they wish. And it became an international uh, project and, and interventions in many parts of the world. I'm currently um, uh, based in Lebanon uh, and um, <clears throat> about to start up in Yemen um, with, with children. Um, what, reflecting on that experience, first of all, globally, um, uh, to corroborate, sadly, Ingrid's comments that one of the things, for example, the, the war longest ago for me is the Bosnian War. And we now know that there were significant increases in perinatal mortality as a result of in, in the post-war period trauma, um, that there were um, problems with suicide as well, suicide rates shot up, um, and also uh, rates of cancer. Though that has, um, there is some debate about those figures, but that, that, that there are certainly significant increases. Um, so many of the things that you've noted seem to be what appear, seems to be emerging in the United Kingdom at this time does parallel what we've observed in other places, sadly. Um, um, to a, a slightly happier um, reflection, um, this summer, um, uh, I had a camp um, at, at, from the very end of the war in Bosnia. I've run summer camps um, for, for, for the children and young people, initially those we were working with, then later for others, largely to keep the knowledge base running, to keep those people active in the region together and in communication, and what better way than to have fun and do some creative stuff together in a summer camp. Um, and I had thought this summer that we were not going to be able to run our camps. Um, uh, it had been cancelled by uh, one in Croatia that was cancelled by the Croatian authorities. I mean, politely. <laughs> for, uh, and, um, and then uh, by, I was surprised at the very last moment when the Bosnian Ministry and, and Centre for Special Needs, I worked with in particular, came back and said, yes, let's do the camp. And the reason was a very interesting one was that they thought, the reason they gave, and their apologies for last minute, was that they felt that the threat to the mental health of the children of not doing things like this was greater than the threat of COVID. And, and the happy story was we had our camp in the mountains near Sarajevo uh, now over a month ago, and everybody as well. Uh, uh, though we took action to ensure that would have, everybody took tests and I have my little thermometer gun and I don't know why I don't see it around in the UK more often <laughs> but uh, we, we were very systematic in, in non-invasive ways of checking on the children. Um, everything was fine. Well, what, the point of the story is that the centre, because it was our 25th year, 25th year of camps, our first camp was at the last year of the war in, in Bosnia, um, uh, just after the war, um, uh, the, the, the special needs centres that we deal with sent along some of the children now young, well actually mature adults who have been in our first cohorts um, and sent them along as part of the group of people for the camp, um, which was wonderful because we question ourselves in this work a lot um, uh, uh, and we should. 
and you know was that really helpful you know did, did we delude ourselves and had seeing some of our people back over 25 years um and the fact they desperately wanted to come um was through us a, a wonderful vindication that something must have been right and what was interesting the story is then a mixed one because um Clearly, we could see, I mean, we could see at the time we were working with these people that we were able to help in various ways with the creative arts. And we can maybe come on later on how it does help. But for the moment that there was help taking place. And what's interesting was a kind of doubly encouraging, discouraging story. At the end is that, yes, some of these young people are making great strides. You know, in uh, I could see how things had improved and, and things were getting better for them after 25 years. But the other thing was that many of them were still, as it were, stuck. Uh, um, in other words, the reason that they were sent by the institution was they were still attending the institution, which has um, occupational therapy and other activities for those that can't find work and do things. After a quarter of a century, they're still there. Um, so in other words, that there is a, a long-term thing, and people talked about ticking time bomb. I mean, for me, rather a long, slow detonation. Um, a very, very long, slow process, confounded also by things like what we call secondary trauma, that situations of trauma, traumatic circumstances, can throw up things whereby we have things like alcoholism, we have abuse, we have, you know, bad behaviour, um, which then has a knock-on effect on the new generation. So, um, so I, I don't want in any way to be pessimistic. I, I believe that we'll get through this in, in, in good and instructive ways. I believe the creative arts have a lot to offer. Um, and we're here waiting. Um, uh, 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 so I have, I'm full of optimism, but to, uh, sadly, to reinforce your point, that, that I, uh, what I see is very long-term effects of things like trauma that can go rolling on and on and on if we don't help people properly. Thank you, Nigel. That's just mm. tremendous and hugely inspiring. I think uh, everyone, had, there's been lots of comments on the side that you may have a chance to glance at now that you've finished talking for the moment um but i think uh i think the consensus is that everybody is absolutely delighted to hear of your work um it is fascinating and interesting and inspiring and it's also lovely that you are optimistic but i take your point about the longer term harms that uh that we, we, we that we will undoubtedly see and people talk about a lost generation which i find terribly dispiriting as a, as a as a phrase and so i suppose one of the things that we might focus on today is how can we redeem a lost generation um as people who are interested in health and arts and and, and well-being and so on what can we do to try and help redeem that generation can i turn please to sally who i think is here sally Rowe, um uh, uh and ask in your experience in local authority, given how many years of austerity and cuts and all the rest of it that that um, that have been experienced in local authorities, how how what does it feel like to you? How well prepared are we in local authority world to support children who are experiencing such trauma to prevent and support them? Sally, can you comment on that? Uh, yeah, hopefully you can hear me. I am here now, having had a bit of a difficulty joining you to start off with. But you're very welcome. Um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, how do I follow Nigel, I suppose, is the <laughs> bringing us back down to the kind of really um, kind of uh, practical side of, of uh, what we have to do, I suppose. Um, the, uh, my background, I'm a director of children's services, um, but um, and my background social work, so uh, a child and family social worker, and I actually uh, trained and worked initially in the local authority that I'm now director of children's services uh, in, having been off around um, a variety of different places, including Ofsted for a period of time, so I'm back in Walsall now and uh, working there, and I think I mean, we really have seen the sharp end of things over the last few months. I think what I would say to you is that, um, you know, social workers, local authorities, um, colleagues, health, police and others um, are really good at rising to the challenge when they need to. And that's absolutely what's happened over the last few months. Um, and that is replicated um, certainly across the 14 authorities in the West Midlands as I chair the regional director of children's services group so I'm sort of privileged to have an overview of what's been happening across the Midlands um, and um, I think we've all been doing the same thing so despite the difficulties that we have which um, have um, undoubtedly led to um, a decrease in services in certainly in some of the areas that are going to be radically important over the next few months and I would particularly highlight youth services 
um, as being part of that. Um, the, I think the first six months of uh, uh, or so of what we've had to do, we've really been able to pull together to use um, community resources um, to support children, to um, support children, particularly when they were out of school. And I think we are only just about starting to see the impact of children not being in school for the length of time that they have been. Um, and so we are able, we have been able to do that. I think we've risen to the challenge. Can we sustain that challenge is what I think is going to be the critical question for us um, in the coming months. And, and we are under no illusion um, that this is going to be over in a short space of time. And we are expecting um, to have to continue to work in the crisis management. And that's what I would call it way that we are currently um, for quite some time before we even really start to get to think about how do we manage the impact long term on children and their families. And I can just give you a few little, um, I suppose, sort of um, things that are starting to come through now. So we are starting to see and have done in my local system um, an increase in children and young people accessing um, crisis support and hospital admission for self-harm. So that fits very much what you said initially, Ingrid, about suicide. And we're seeing the earlier start of that. Um, and uh, my social work staff actually reported to me this week significant concerns about some young people that we have um, who've um, ended up probably not necessarily in the best place in the, in the acute hospital system um, with very severe anxiety around COVID and the implications for their future. And I think that is starting to manifest itself now. Um, when children went back to school in September, or majority of children went back to school in September, um, I think children were very, just very pleased to be back into their normal routine and seeing their friends and seeing their teachers because they've missed them. What we are now see, starting to see is the children and young people who are struggling to reintegrate into school on a regular basis. Um, we've certainly got children and young people who are too frightened to go to school at the moment. Um, and I think we have to um, kind of recognise that the messages that have been given out nationally, quite rightly, about COVID are very strong in terms of protection and protecting yourself. And we've now expected our children to go back into school into an environment where the teachers are working incredibly hard to do the right things for themselves and for the pupils and their families. But actually that's quite difficult to achieve in reality if you want every child back in the classroom. Um, and I'm having personally having to have difficult conversations with head teachers um, about how many children we send home when there's an outbreak in their school and what that means for those children and their families. So, you know, that's a real live kind of um, difficulty for us at the moment. Um, and I think one of the most, somebody's just said on the chat about it being heartbreaking, I absolutely agree. And one of the most heartbreaking things that I've heard in the last two weeks, um, because our area is starting to go back into some form, and I'm not going to use the word lockdown because I think we've moved on from using that word, but into the local alert levels, and we're now in local alert level um, high risk um, in, the mid in most of the Midlands, um, certainly in my area. One of the conversations that we've had to have is having moved to a position where um, we had reinstated mainly face-to-face -face contact for children in care with their parents in our, uh, what we, we call it family time in Warsaw, we don't call it contact, but we brought back family time on a face-to-face -face basis for most children and their families. We've now had to have a conversation um, uh, with uh, staff and with families about, do we move back from that because of the risk level that we are now in? Um, and one of my staff uh, talked very movingly during the week about um, particularly our children under the age of one who are in the care system, who have visibly found it difficult to go back to the position where they were having face to face contact, seeing both the workers and their parents in uh, protective um, uh, clothing, eye gloves and face masks that we have had to use at times to protect everybody um, and not wanting to, re to stop that face-to-face -face contact now, having just reinstated it because of the potential emotional impact on those children. And these children and families that we're working with, where we are hoping those children will return home to their parents to live um, by and large. And I think, you know, I hadn't probably even myself fully thought through the impact that that might be having for our children and families and the, you know, what we may have to do in the future for those children to help them reintegrate back to their families, having had this experience. So I suppose um, what I would also say, because I don't want this to be all doom and gloom, I think 
Um, we've got staff across the board who've been really creative in the ways that they've supported children. We've got a very good uh, CAMS mental health service, certainly in my area, and they've worked really closely with us over the last few months to continue to support families, um, to continue to deliver really creative um, work with children using mediums like this, certainly my social workers have. And in some cases, we've had feedback directly from children and young people, particularly our children in care, who've said, actually, we've had more contact with people because we've found people more accessible over the last few months and that that's been a benefit for us. So I think um, somebody else talked earlier, and I think that was you, Ingrid, about um, the changes in the way of working in the health system. I think that's also the same in local government. And I think there are things that we can learn from this um, that we won't necessarily want to stop doing in the future that can better help us support children and young people in the ways that they um, like to communicate, for example, um, uh, alongside recognising that we're going to have a lot of work to do. And I haven't talked much about youth services, but I did mention that in, ter in terms of austerity. And I do think that's an area that nationally we've got to look at. You know, how do we put together a set of things that can support young people who might be thinking that, you know, their future isn't necessarily what they thought it was going to be, perhaps even, you know, half a year ago. Um, better and, and those are the very services that unfortunately austerity has def most definitely had a significant and profound impact on. Sally that's extremely helpful thank you. So you, you've helpfully alluded to where I want this I hope this conversation to go um, to which is um, well well, I definitely want to touch on austerity and how how much that may or may not have affected that our kind of baseline response and what we can do about it but I really want to take that and everything else to move on um, soonish to thinking about what we can do about things and so what what we should keep out of what we've learned from this is one such aspect but before I do can I please ask Swaran to, to talk about child and adolescent mental health services um, as CAM services but also about school-based mental health please. Swan, we can't hear you yet. I'm afraid you're still on mute. I, I do beg your pardon. Can you hear me? <laughs> right. I, I, I was going to come to camp, but I thought I'd make a couple of observations. Uh, one is that we, we are really in, in uncharted waters. I mean, it's a cliche, but there is no textbook we can rely on. You know, there's nothing off the shelf we can say, now what do we do? And Unlike natural disasters, which come or, or, or in adversity and then life moves on, we are in a period of prolonged uncertainty. Now, people can deal with a lot of adversity. It's uncertainty and, and not being sure of what the future brings. That chronic uncertainty is very damaging for mental health. It really is. And the other thing that this particular pandemic has done, it's taken away our natural instinct to huddle, you know, when when we are under stress, we, we retreat into the comfort of those we know. We go into a social huddle with our loved ones and the lockdown and the social distancing has created a, has, has stopped us from doing what comes absolutely naturally to us. Um, and and that's, been, that's been very difficult. It's been difficult for, for, for young people. I've got, I've got young kids um, and I found that they they found the isolation from each other, you know, not being able to see grandparents, not being able to see friends, very, very difficult. Despite, besides all the other things that you were talking about. And so a very helpful thing that I've noticed is asking young people about their fears. Y young people will fear the worst if you don't, if you know, if they feel something is being hidden, if things are not being, you know, if they are not being heard. So asking them about their fears and valid, validating those fears and validating those worries is very helpful. And also then giving them honest reassurance, not, not, not made up reassurance. They will see through it, they are very canny, but honest reassurance I think is very helpful. Now coming to your question about CAMS and, and uh, youth mental health services. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those areas where each successive government promises more funding into 
children and youth mental health because it's a surefire, they believe, vote winner. Who would argue against it? And yet it's always jammed tomorrow. It's always, it's, it's always coming. And when it does come, it goes into plugging holes into acute care. I think if we don't, it would be a disgrace collectively for us if we don't take this opportunity to ensure that camp services are properly funded and the youth services. I, I, many of you who are clinically active will know that our entire understanding of mental disorders has been turned on its head in the last 20 years by this recognition that serious mental disorders of adulthood begin during teen years. They begin, 50% begin before the age of 16. And it's this 14 to 20 age group that's least likely to engage with help. You know, when people are physically strong enough and robust enough to win Wimbledon championships, they are at their most psychological vulnerable. You think of young people as robust because they feel physically robust. And I think this is a real opportunity for us giving our young people the services they deserve. And I think camps need strengthening and youth services need absolute remodeling and there has to be ring-fenced money. And I think if, 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 if we really need to build a momentum about, about this. Everybody is talking about the coming epidemic. How can we then not, not do something for it now? The other point I think you and I were talking, Ingrid, earlier is that it's not just camps. It's not just looking after those who clearly need help. There's much that can be done preventive, in a preventive manner. So we don't have to wait for people to be unwell. So we, we are doing quite a bit of uh, work on school mental health. I've got some colleagues on, on the talk here and I, I noticed a, a brilliant uh, headmaster of a junior school in, in uh, West Midlands who's also on, 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 the, on the webinar. And they've done great things in, in improving the mental health of young people. Now, people think of school mental health as somehow going around seeing who's unwell in a school. It's not about that, it's about resilience. It's not a deficit model. It's not what is lacking. It's what can be built. Uh, again, many schools do not have access to good quality counseling services. Many young people with the kind of anxiety and mood symptoms that they have related to pandemic don't need to see a psychiatrist. They don't even need to see a doctor. They need, but but it's too complex for a, for a teacher to deal with. They need something in the middle, some reassuring voice, trusting, confidential, reassuring voice that they can they can turn to. And I think the time for school mental health has really come. So I, I think if we could build build momentum on on investing in school mental health, both resilience and prevention, and then strengthening camps, we will we we will do a lot in mitigating against the effect of this this pandemic. Thank you, Swan. That's that, that's really helpful. Can I um, just continue this strand of the conversation uh, for a minute? Because Alexis has asked a really interesting question, and that is about our future carers, medical students who are, of course, young adults. And uh, I include amongst that my daughter, who's 19 and a medical student, and reports to me quite regularly about what's happening with her peers. And it's not a very happy uh, environment, I can tell you. And I'm sure you'll all have your own stories and experiences of these uh, things. So Alexis writes that there's, wonders whether there's adverse effects on the compassion, empathy, coping and early burnout. That's a huge worry. Um, and so, and even more so perhaps for minority students who are um, a, a smaller number and um, maybe experiencing even more social isolation. And so perhaps we could think a little bit about young people's uh, mental health and future carers and medical students and nursing students and, and social work students and so on. What is happening with, the, with that group? Swaran, do you have any insights? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize you were asking me. Yes, I, well, well, we, start with. There, is, there is clearly, um, there has been an, an, a real increase in anxiety and mood disorders mm -hmm. in young people around uh, between the ages of 17 and 20 in England. That has been that has been shown quite robustly. And quite of it is related to 
the uh, uh, children in quite of it is it, it, children in education it, schools and universities universities students are under you know very new pressures some to do with finances some to do with academic pressures some and i i think the pandemic will have only made things worse mm. many kids are now not able to work so so they 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 the way of supporting their their grants by by doing a bit of work that's out they are stuck in universities they they can't they can't go home they can't they can't work i think it's it's clearly a very big worry now now what we can do about it at this stage i don't know i think we will have to think about some community resources and some youth participation activities like tajal was mentioning the, the thing that they did uh, mm-hmm. some way of engaging young people in a in an activity that brings them together i saw i i'm i digress i saw a wonderful performance of uh, Mo, uh, rebels bolero of young people each in their bedroom and playing the entire piece and the guy on the snare drum was you know he, he had to focus or it's i it's i i showed it to my son and he said that's wonderful you know maybe we can do something like a play together or or or, or poetry i think we have to think of creative ways we we can't depend entirely i take a point about austerity and services but i think we've got to create develop some some creative ways knowing that students at at schools and universities are struggling some way of bringing them together i wish i had a simple answer for you i think if there was a simple answer we would have found it by now so well I- can i turn to nigel then and 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 um perhaps we can explore what what possible ways there might be to to think about arts and creative um creative therapeutic uh, uh interventions that can be done remotely um and if i can ask um if i can ask nigel to comment and then sally i've noted that you put your hand up to nigel first please yes yes i mean i think that uh, we have a lot to offer i'm part of my optimism um in some ways uh, you mentioned this this crisis has been full of negatives but some positives and some silver linings and one is that i think from the the, the case and the for for music and arts in health i think in the last 3 or 4 months has leapt ahead at least a decade um i've been developing resources for nhs um online resources and we are moving into areas not just you know related to depression anxiety but to perinatal care um uh, elective cesarean operations um uh, you know the care of the elderly um things that i thought would be a, you know in, in in the long distant future and as we evolved all of this and maybe not in my lifetime so it's been you know that that's been positive um so first of all there's been a, a rapid i think evolution not just in what we know how to do but also in people's appreciation that that can work so for example in our online resources for the recovery college which are a series of playlists to help you move from one state of mind to another i use a technology called exsystem to do that um to to provide us with the figures to do that and predictions of um, uh, neurophysiological effects we've had you know tremendous evaluations and such as you don't get for you know normally in medicine <laughs> and it's also something very interesting about science why are those results so good because it's been done impeccably excellent statisticians why are they so much better than other times because people wanted and needed it it wasn't a paid group of you know of volunteers um uh, being measured you know drifting in on a saturday afternoon to do this that the other side so you know it was tells us something about passion in science and and so uh, on the positive side things are developing i think that the remotely we have online resources also in terms of of a participation there are also ways in which we can use technologies just in the last month um it's interesting how you know when the nettles in the forest dock leaves you know crop up um so also in the last month we have a new technology developed in stanford called uh, jack trip uh, which gets rid of the latency problems you know when you try and do performance together live um there's a, a delay that makes that impossible so the revels bolero was done by everybody recording separately at a different time overlaying their track um which is nice and great but however how much better to do it like a real community at the same time so i would like i mean i'm trying to persuade education services to look at this um uh, there are really ways um another of the problems we have in the situation is that many of the things if you do accept 
that creative arts are useful. And by the way, I'm really happy to start rolling out why I think they're useful and why we found out they're useful in what specific ways, and if you want at some point. Um, but for the moment, um, we, if we accept that there is some use, we're in a paradoxical situation because for the arts, first of all, suffered very much from austerity. Then at the outset of the COVID crisis, um, the government for an industry that gives it 111 billion pounds a year forked out 1.4 billion to support it, whereas the German government forked out 51 billion. Um, to support. So in Germany values its art world 5,000% more greatly than the British do. Um, uh, so, uh, 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 and that, that is not said in anger, but just in reality. So we've got a big problem of our resources being, the, the very resources we need being, being decimated at the moment we need them. I think we'll win that one, but we have to motivate young people and we have to give them the, the, the wind in their sails to do this. It needs a national movement to, to get that, that moving. Um, so I believe in that. And also the other thing that we've suffered from, what the children most need in school, I think singing and, and doing creative things together. And of course, singing is not, full, full voice singing is not on the agenda for most education authorities. And um, I suspect while the evidence remains as it is, that's correct. But there are ways around that. There's, you know, when the weather's good enough, there's outside. And there's also, what about radio mics? What about soft singing turning you into a big, wonderful, glorious choir? I'm sorry, we have this technology, it would cost nine pounds a person. And no cross infection, people have their own mics, right? They keep them, look after them. Um, um, so um, I think all sorts of optimistic, visionary ways of doing this. I know the tech companies would come with us on this with deals. I, I, you know, um, but it does need guidance because what we're having at the moment is a situation where so far, um, you know, the government and others are coming with restrictions and prescriptions, quite rightly, I'm not criticizing that. Um, but the, the creative um, kickback is coming from inventive music teachers. <laughs> and, and I would like them to be empowered uh, uh, so, there are, there are, so my optimistic story is there's a great deal, and, and maybe later, if you give me the time, I could point to some of our evidence as to how, with specifically post-trauma and things, we can really help at lots of levels. Um, but for the moment, if people accept the general idea, we've got those difficulties. Um, and I think they, they can be overcome, but it needs concerted action by the right people. Um, and I think, you know, in conversations like this are probably the ones that are going to start it, which is why I'm here, apart from enjoying your company, um, I'm trying to galvanize, you know, a movement that will get these things sorted. That's absolutely wonderful, Nigel. Thank you. We're going to make sure that we have enough time to talk about uh, practical solutions and then try and make a plan for what we as a group of people can, can help do something about those things. Um, okay, now, can I please ask Sally to comment because you had your hand up and then after that, I want to ask Swaran something. Okay, so it was really just to add to the um, conversation um, where you talked about um, young people particularly moving into roles where they're responsible for children and, and partly like yourself, uh, I'd got a uh, slight self-interest in that uh, my son's currently in teacher training, so <laughs> training to be a primary school teacher, so uh, uh, so we've been kind of living both sides of the coin, really, in terms of my doing my day job, but also supporting him and being conscious that he was going into schools and actually coming back home. And we've got obviously increasing rates of positivity in teaching staff. So I've been managing both those ends of the spectrum, really. And I think um, certainly um, from our perspective, one of the things that we'll really take away from what's happened is I think the relationship with schools for local authorities has really changed um, with schools over the last few months in that we'd had um, a period, I think, of very fractured relationships because of academisation. Um, that's altered quickly since March in that we've been working really closely with schools, uh, certainly in my area, but across the region. Um, I think they feel that local authorities have very much supported them in managing the interactions, particularly with the Department of Education, which has been really important. But more importantly, I think one of the things that we've been able to do is think very much about the welfare and the mental health of our teaching staff. Um, so just to give you an example from my own local authority, we put in a programme that we call Headspace, um, which we had running right from March, which was to give um, particularly head teachers um, a, a private, quiet, confidential space to talk about their fears and worries. Um, and if I said to you that was well used, I think that would be an understatement, quite frankly. So. I think um, we've learned quite a lot from that in terms of how we should support staff through difficult times, how we work differently with our schools. Um, I think it's probably something we should be doing across the spectrum really with staff who are having to 
interface with the public at the moment and I'm not sure we are doing it well enough in other areas if I'm honest I'm also non-executive director for Walsall Healthcare Trust and I know it's something that we're having lots of conversations about in terms of health staff um, uh, in that role too so I do think that you know there's been a real change in the way we work with schools for the better um, and I think that will carry on post um, whatever happens in the next few months um, but I also think we've got to look much more at how we um, generally support our caring staff broadly, and that includes teachers too. Thank you. That's extremely helpful. Soren, I wanted to pick up with you a few, um, I think, important points that we make sure we cover. One mm -hmm. is um, the, the notion of, of, of equity and in, inequity and in, inequalities. So I think we have a big problem in this country in inequalities, and I think that what's happening is 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 exposing even more so what's going on so i want to think a little bit about inequalities in in in, in the national setting but i'd also like to think about inequalities globally and what's happening across the world particularly in low and middle income countries could if you could comment please sure sure thanks thanks ingrid um nationally we have known for about 30 years now that some of our minority communities um are exposed to so many risk factors mm. um, like poor housing, unemployment, social uh, marginalization, exclusion, societal racism, disadvantage, that they have much higher rates of mental illness. Physically, many minority groups have comorbid conditions that, that put them at higher risk. And of course, they also have poor housing and you know, multi-generational families. So like you say, the pandemic has revealed Everything that's everything that's wrong in 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 uh, health health inequality. I mean, we always knew it, but this has you know it's really held a mirror up to us to say you know this is what reality looks like. What are you going to do about it? Uh, I think there are there are moves afoot. I know for certain that the Department of Health has taken it very seriously, and they are they are trying to do something about it. Again, it's a complex problem, uh, but it is one that we can no longer shy away from. We, we can no longer just, you know, blame social situation and then sit back uh, in, in passive uh, retreat saying, well, th this, is, this is how life is. I think we've got to deal with that nationally. The, it's, it's a triple whammy for minority groups, really. Pre-existing, poor health, then uh, the uh, physical ill health, and then the pandemic the effect of the pandemic. Globally, the bulk of young people in the world live in low and middle income countries. You know, 60% of India's population is under 20, or is it some, some such figure. And that's where services are most uh, scarce, you know, the least available. I don't know if many people know, but uh, globally, in low middle income countries, the proportion of people with COVID who are under 20 is much higher. So in the in 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 the West, say it's around it's less than five percent of the total proportion of people who have uh, a COVID infection. In Paraguay, it's 20 percent. One in fifth of every COVID positive case in Paraguay is under 20. Overall, in LMIC, it's 11 percent. So, so there is. There is then the problem of being out of school. UNESCO did a report recently on the effect of uh, school education in, in the pandemic. 50% of children in low and middle income countries have no access to computers or internet. So even where schools are trying to, so think about those kids, you know, they're at high risk of infection. They are, they're much poorer physical health. They are now isolated. They've got very little access. And I think it's a, it's a real, really worrying thing. Again, I, there, there is one study from India showing about 40% of young people they spoke to spoke about significant anxiety and depression. We did pre-COVID, we did a large screening in uh, South India, about 15,000 young kids between the ages of 16 and 20. This is pre-COVID, one in five, had significant mental health concerns, largely anxiety and depression. Between eight and 10%, one in 10 had a major problem which required clinical intervention. So this is pre-COVID. 
Now, if you think about what is happening, so I think both internationally and nationally, COVID has really shown a bright light on health inequities. And I think it's it, we, we've really got to do something about it. We really have to. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, that's a very helpful comment. Okay, so we've got um, just under half an hour, I think, left. And I wonder if it's time now to start thinking about how we're going to respond to all of this. So we've got in this room, this virtual room, an enormous range of, of experts and, and interested parties in different perspectives and all sorts of really rather wonderful creative insights to, dare I say it, um, to, 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 to what this, these problems are and what we might do about it. So I wonder if we could start to talk about how should we guide what principles should guide how we respond? What could we do as a group, for example, about what's going on? Could we maybe as a group um, pull together, you know, some evidence about things? Would we like to make a statement about what we think should be happening, about the trauma that children are, are facing and what can be done about it? What can we do as a, as, as a group here? Sally, what do you think from a local authority point, point of view? Would it, how, how would in local government, and if you have any insights how, in, in national government, what would, what would, how would such a thing land? Would it be helpful to have a kind of consensus statement out of this group of people about what we think should be happening? I think, I think it would, because I think one of the challenges that we've got, particularly with central government, and this isn't a political point, it's probably a personal view, although I have heard it echoed in other um, uh, meetings I've been in recently is that one of the major concerns we have is that there is no joined up approach to children across central government. So actually for the <laughs> sector to start to reflect that back in a joined up approach and joined up statements I think would be incredibly powerful and very useful. So what we find for example is the funding streams are um, you know they're separated across the DfE, uh, the Departments of Health and Social Care, um, the Ministry of Justice um, uh, and uh, MHDCLG as well and um, our conversation with government as a result is very difficult and very fragmented which is a challenge mm -hmm. so for the sector to start to recognize that and respond in a way that gives that joint challenge back I think would be a very very helpful thing to do indeed. Well, that's extremely helpful to hear. I, I've heard similar things in the Department of Health that, you know, why don't you folk in, in child health get your act together and stop speaking? So for certainly in the medical world, you know, we've got this college and that college, and we're really usually talking about, frankly, the profession rather than the population that we're serving, which is a, it's a problem. We need to turn that around. So, so why don't we, as a group, try and try and figure that out before before we get onto the specifics? Though there are a couple of things I wanted to talk about. Two things. One is how can we bring in the voice of children and young people? Peter, in, at the outset, rightly explained how difficult it is to do that in this sort of a meeting, but we can think about how we might do that for our work going forward. Um, and um, so there are a couple of things I wanted to think about. One is that somebody made a very helpful comment. Uh, Trudy, I think, about how children and young people feel that things are being done to them rather than with them, and how we don't ask them, and for heaven's sakes, you know, we should be, and, and how can we do better at that? So I wanted to, to raise that, and then also, um, if Mark Penny has written a very nice uh, comment, um, and I don't know, Mark, if you wanted to actually speak to that, you'd be more than welcome to do so. Please just um, come in if, if you would like to do that. Um, and then I think we'll move on after that towards evidence and thinking about how we bring that together. Mark, did you want to have a, a, a quick word about the, the lovely thing, comment that you've written about your experience of primary care children, primary care, primary aid, school age children? Yeah, uh, uh, thanks very much, Ingrid. Um, hi, guys, I'm Mark. I'm a head of um, a prep school in Solihull. Um, yeah, I'm a, it's fascinating to listen to, listen to you guys because I don't often get involved in the critical care end and I, I'm unfortunate for that regard, but I'm conscious that there are very, very many thousands of children who do. And uh, I think one of the things that I'm conscious of as a head is that we have an extraordinary opportunity 
to influence our parents and our children in how they perceive and how they shape and um, understand what's going on in their experiences, the pandemic or pandemic aside, whatever it is they're experiencing. And we, we get to either um, mold that in a positive or optimistic way, or we get to really diminish that by adding, adding and, and projecting our own stress and anxieties onto them. So teaching staff are under enormous pressure and have been for some time. I've seen parents under more pressure than I've ever known them to be before. If I guess to some extent in the prevention that um, Swaran um, was alluding to, which is an area that we're very focused on as a school. How do we, on a national level, get, get parents and teachers away from the horrendous negativity, uh, relentless negativity, 24 um, seven wranglings of the, of the pandemic issues? They are very real and they're very proper and they, they, they need and deserve a, a whole lot of direct interventions to, to just reduce the sheer number that guys like yourselves are dealing with at the sharp end of what happens as a cure. But it's the response and the prevention that really intrigues me in terms of how we do that. And I think unless we have a national voice that talks about transience, that this thing won't last forever and that hope isn't lost. Um, in another context, a swarm will know this. We've been very fortunate as a school to work with Holocaust survivors. Uh, I've also, in another context, worked with um, civil war victims, innocent victims of civil war in Sri Lanka. And in, in all cases, the lack of hope and the lack of the sense that this is not permanent, it's not pervasive, is the thing that can really bring people down. And I understand that there are people who are predisposed to critical care and there's not much we can do in all ways. But I think there's probably a lot we can do with the, with the low level to moderate that becomes more exaggerated and that wave perpetuates and puts untenable pressures, it seems to me, on, the, on you guys. Whereas I guess I'm interested in what can we do with schools because I'm one of you know many thousands of people who can perhaps influence a large number of people to roll back the tide um, so that we can head it off at the pass, I guess. Well, that's an extremely interesting thing to say. Thank you. I think, I think, it, I think that what you're saying is the importance of mental health promotion. So, yeah. you know, we can't take away the... The, the awful stuff that is happening and there's no good just and I'm not going to name names but everyone will know who I'm talking about it's no good just being cheerful in you know and, and that's it yeah, uh, exactly. and, and trying to be a kind of national political cheerleader is is inappropriate in the circumstances but there is a lot that we can do about mental health promotion isn't there so let's come on to talk about what the evidence is because um, Swaran's um, colleague and student has written um, to me, he's got very poor Wi-Fi, so he's asked me to put something across, and I think it's really interesting. They've been doing some work with the uh, Wellcome Trust <clears throat> on understanding the ingredients of things that can prevent mental health problems, promote good mental health and so on in the theatre and the arts, and this is super interesting. And what I've learned in this, I didn't know this, but I was hoping it was true, and so this is really cheerful stuff, that the evidence for um, prevention programs is actually very, very strong. The arts have a positive effect in improving and enhancing pro-social behavior, self-esteem, self-efficacy, self-confidence. I think this is one of those things that we all sort of intuitively know, but to have something to sit in writing that has shown it with rigorous methods is extremely helpful. So I'm starting to see a consensus statement that we can write as a group to say from all these different disciplines and bridging all of the different fractured child health, uh, you know, uh, policy worlds and, and professionals and so on. Why don't we think about pulling all of that together as a group and writing it to all of the various bodies, same letter to all of them, publicly and privately. So, um, so. Okay. Sorry, what were you going to say? I think that would be amazing. I think it's, I think it's just... There's, you know, it's the credibility, it's the consistency, it's the it's the far-reaching approach that, you know, just a, just a knowledge that there are things that people can do. My experience is that most people will do most things if you tell them what direction to go in, um, but it does it, it gets drowned out in the national um, dystopia. Yeah, it does indeed. It does indeed. Okay, so let's try to think about the evidence and how we're going to pull it together. And, and what I would really like from people, please, whilst we're talking, is to is to put on the chat who wants to be involved. Give me your email addresses and tell me if you want to be involved and we'll and we'll start to pull something together. <clears throat> but can I first start to think about 
Because one of the interesting things about this session, and one of the things that appealed to me, and I suspect a lot of us, is the is the is the very fruitful join up of arts and sciences. How wonderful! I've I've always disagreed with this sort of false dichotomy between them, but it's wonderful to to come together as a community to think about a much more joined up. I hate that word holistic, but you know what I mean, approach to thinking about well-being and health and all of those things that, that brings together both of these important, equally important and complementary parts of the world. So how can we use this uh, this event and this next piece of work that I think we're going to do together to start to work more collaboratively between the arts and the sciences to promote the well-being of our children. So any comments on that, Nigel, while we, um, while I hope people start writing their email addresses? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that um, there are some very concrete things here and optimistic things. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the answer is staring us in the face. Um, I think part of that is the creative arts, sport, and various other things have a great deal to offer at this moment in time. Also, by the way, for children communicating with, you know, others, the arts are a great way. Um, you know, stick a child in front of a camera with a microphone, get very nervous being asked about what they feel and what they want, but drawing us a picture and telling us a story uh, and making up a song could be much better, nicer way of doing it. Um, I, what I'd like to do, what I've been doing about people writing is um, to report is one of the things that I was invited to do was to bring our experience in aid work of dealing with extreme forms of trauma. What can we do practically with children? And I've been talking to music teachers and, and creative arts teachers. Um, interestingly, telling them you know, what we've done and how we did it, but also to say that there's nothing new they have to learn. What, uh, what we're saying is we are validating what you do and we want you to do it more and better, um, deeply and with more joy. Um, so just to be very brief, to give an example of the sorts of things we have, we look at creative arts interventions with trauma on a biopsychosocial model, as you might expect. Very strong and never reported as the biological part. We find, I mean, this is an, an, a bit of thing that might be useful from the field of, of, you know, trauma work in the field, might be useful, is that we can really get at a lot of things at the biological level. So, for example, in trauma, underreported is the fact that the autonomic system is on high alert, that heart rate is going up by average five to six beats a minute with children. Um, and, and that there are ways that particularly music and movement are incredibly interactive with the autonomic nervous system and can help regulate it and exercise it. Um, that there is also with breathing, one of the most involving things, never reported properly in the trauma literature, um, uh, problems with breathing, um, <laughs> vagal interference with pathways um, and the fact is there again we have in music and dance and other things and, and, and in drama uh, we have exactly the ways to open up those pathways and we can see it happening in front of our eyes you know it, it, it's some um, they often whenever we do our work there, there are um, a certain number of people if they observe it usually go away quite surprised saying my goodness me that was fast Sometimes we can make very, of course, to establish those changes, to embed them can take a long time, but we can make effects quickly. So breathing, movement, movement repertoires in children with, uh, with, with trauma can go to extremes. They can be comorbid with hyperactivity. ADHD was identified as comorbid with PTSD not long ago, um, but also, uh, you know, very sluggish behaviors, you know, corresponding to the, you know, uh, diagnostic statistical manual categories. Um, we can see all of that. And there again, Music is fantastic and drama, it, it is the very core of that. You know, we are, music has a hotline, some of the most primitive of, of, of brainstem systems to inspire movement. Um, and right the way through to being able to excite the motor cortex in regulated ways. Why aren't we using that? Well, every music teacher can do it in the country with the kids. Just told how important it is, how significant it is. And finally, endocrine things on the biological thing. Um, you know, uh, cortisol, the most reported area of this, you know, when a traumatic event occurs, cortisol might well go sky high. And then a sign, a sure sign of chronic trauma is when it goes too low. Uh, and there again, our arts are incredibly interactive with the HPA access. access. I suspect it's because in our evolution, we used 
this kind of human expression to regulate ourselves, our relationships and ourselves. And so why aren't we engaging with this? Why can't we have a renaissance of human qualities <laughs> coming out of all of this? Uh, and I haven't even begun to talk about creativity, cognition, trust, empathy, self-belief, joy. I haven't even begun to go around the circle. I'm not going to because we don't have time. Um, but what I'm trying to say is there is, a, there is a massive body of evidence. Our evidence is not mostly from the field. We triangulate because I am not able to create control groups in refugee camps, sorry. Uh, I will not on ethical grounds, nor can I practice it, because the populations are moving the whole time. But we do have great evidence of work with children in other circumstances, where we can see changes in heart, right, all of these. So we've, we've got a massive evidence base um, in, in neurophysiology, as we have in social, biosocial and other areas. So um, my, my appeal would be to, to use what we've got and empower people with what we've got. Um, and actually that's a sure way of fighting back the tide of Philistinism that destroyed our arts world. Um, I would see a, a wonderful way of, of bringing art back in society in this reparative creative way without moaning or complaining to anybody. <laughs> we, we just get moving. Um, so I, I'm just agreeing with the, 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 the head teacher, I missed the name, uh, Mark, sorry, Mark, yes. Um, I'm, I'm agreeing with Mark, the need for a kind of motivation or, um, you know, come on, let's get on with this. There's a chance here in all the misery, do something really very creative and beautiful. Uh, that is uh, wonderful. What a lovely, inspiring, um, way to, well, I was going to say finish, but we're not quite finished yet, but we are going to need to wrap up. We're in the final stages. I will write to everyone afterwards um, who has very kindly put forward their email addresses, um, but let's use these uh, last few minutes as productively as we can. Can I please ask Swarren to come in uh, now and then after that, Sally, for some final thoughts? Yeah, thank you very much. That, that This has been absolutely inspirational. <clears throat> I wanted to make a point uh, going forward, people assume that mental well-being and mental illness are no continuum. That if you promote mental well-being, you will prevent mental illness. That's not strictly true. They are orthogonal dimensions. They intersect, but they are not on the same line. The reason why I'm saying that is that we should not make a case that we want to do prevention and promotion because there's not enough money for camps. Mental well-being is a good in itself. Arts and mental well-being are very closely related, as Nigel has said. Uh, for those of you who haven't read, read it, there's a book called The Body Keeps a Score and actually captures everything that Nigel has just said about the effect of trauma on our bodies. So I think we should, we should focus on mental health services but we should also focus specifically on mental well-being. I know a number of people have argued, as have I, most of my working life for more money for youth mental health. I think this group should be slightly different. I think we should argue for mental well-being. We should ask for public mental health. We should argue for positive mental health. And I think that would be our unique selling point. I love it. That's absolutely wonderful. Um, Sally, few words from you, please. We've got about another less than five minutes, please, from you. Okay, I think really struck by what Mark said earlier, and, and I've heard things said very similar from many head teachers um, in uh, the last few months. And I think um, for me, what we should be doing is really asking or talking um, nationally about how we can start to promote some positive messages uh, to our children and young people about the future. And I think, um, you know, Nigel also making those, um, the, you know, very clear um, messages really around how in other times, in other traumas, um, children, young people and their families have been supported and assisted to come uh, through, through that. And I think, you know, we have got to start, start to think about what does that look like for us nationally over the next few months? Because I don't think, um, I think, so it's been quite hard, hasn't it, in lots of ways, because I think many of us have been so so quickly launched into a crisis response that you just find yourself dealing with what you're presented with on a daily basis. And I, I, I am certainly still in that position as a, as a senior member of our team in, in local government. Um, I chair the council's gold command, so I'm very much into the practical, how does the council get through this on a day-to-day -day basis? And how does the community in Warsaw get through it on a day-to-day -day basis? 
Um, I think we have got to start to move on to think about what does that look like for the future? How do we turn some of what we've learning in, learned and, and what we know about now into positive messages for our children and young people? Because I don't think we should underestimate the impact that the last few months has had and you know what's coming ahead of us over the next few months. And you know, for many of us, we've not lived through the things that families have lived through in war zones, et cetera. I haven't in my lifetime. Uh, my parents did and my grandparents did, but I haven't. Um, and I'm not sure we fully understand it at the moment. Um, so certainly the messages from uh, Nigel in particular about, you know, the experiences and, and the things that he's seen are actually very useful, I think, for us in shaping our thinking for the future. That's super. Thank you uh, very much, Sally. OK, well, I think we've got a really nice consensus around the need to do something positive, the need to be do something creative that brings together uh, science and art for the benefit of our children and young people to try and prevent the lost generation that people now sort of talking about. I mean, how hideous. We I think we owe it uh, to them to try to do that. And I can't think of a better way than, than, than to build on the conversation that we've had today, which has been really hugely interesting and, and inspiring um, and, and great. So thank you all very, very much for your contributions and your insights and your positivity and, and your support for trying to pull this together into something interesting, which we will do. Okay, can I please hand back then uh, to Peter with huge thanks for organising such a marvellous uh, session for us. Thank you ever so much. Oops, sorry. Thank you, Ingrid. I've just got to manage the technology for one second. I mean, first of all, I'd just like to say that um, I, I feel really proud that, um, that we've been able to create the opportunity to have that session. I think that... Um, hugely stimulating conversation about really important issues. Um, for some reason, Rachel, I don't know whether you can get these last slides to move because they're stuck on my system. That's a challenge for Rachel. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll let you see my face. Well, okay. What I wanted to just say, just um, as we come into the end of it, first of all, just um, before I turn to thanking the panel properly, just to remind people, there's a few more sessions um, as part of the Insight Festival um, for the rest of this week. Um, this week is Health Inequalities Week. We've then got a break and then we've actually got another couple of weeks coming up. Um, this is a festival that was going to be one day long and I went on holiday and came back and it had been turned into a six week one. But, but it's been spectacularly um, enjoyable thing to do and, and hopefully useful. So you can see the sessions there. Um, just to carry on our, our interest in connecting with the arts, um, we won't be showing it on Friday, but, but we're very pleased that we're going to be doing an hour-long interview with Hashim Mohammed, um, the author of um, People Like Us. Um, probably read about Hashim's experience from, I think, Sudanese refugee, I think it was, to, to becoming a top barrister in this country. And he's going to reflect on his learning for what that means about uh, health inequalities in this country. But in the spirit of the conversation we've just had, um, I'm very keen to suggest that we, just before we end the session, we just take four minutes, if you've got the time, four minutes, to just hear out the remainder of, of Nigel's piece. This is the Cantheon. Um, and then just at the end of that, I'll just, I'll just close it down. And I hope that, that you find this a useful four minutes for some reflection. Mm -hmm.